What's up everybody, welcome back. Today we're gonna to talk about photo composite animations, what they are and how to make them. Now you've probably seen a lot of these floating around the internet recently. Uh, basically what they are in short is you take a, an image and you separate out the foreground from the background or the subject from the background and you place them on a different plane in 3D space and you make an artificial camera to move around to give you some parallax. It kind of tricks your brain into thinking it's 3D when really it's only 2.5D because all the elements in the video um, are only two-dimensional images set in 3D space. If they were actual 3D elements, you could call it a 3D animation, but today we're gonna take these three images and we're gonna composite them together to make this. These first two pictures are from an Iceland trip a couple years ago, and this last one is of my friend Kent doing a backflip off of the Point Reyes boat before it burned down, uh, RIP. So what do you need to make an animation like this? You're going to need these photos, which I'll include as a downloadable link in the description if you want to follow along. And two is Adobe Photoshop, and lastly, Adobe After Effects. So let's go ahead and jump into it. All right, so open up Photoshop, and we're gonna drag and drop this first photo into Photoshop. We're gonna unlock it from the background layer and duplicate it by hitting Command J. And I'm going to rename these layers. You can rename them whatever you want if you'd like. Uh, we just wanna make sure that we are staying organized. So first type of selection tool we're going to use here is the pen tool. So we're just, we're just gonna cut out this foreground layer and later we'll end up using the quick selection tool. But for this foreground, because the pixels are super similar, we're gonna just use the pen tool. When you're done, right click and make selection. A feather of two pixels is fine for most of this stuff. We'll select the inverse now and delete the sky. And now we're gonna hide that layer and switch over, select inverse again. And this time we're going to delete the other image. So we have these two layers separated and now it's time to use our edit and content aware fill. If you don't like what the auto selection has chosen, you're going to hold option on your keyboard and deselect the section. I feel like this is pretty good. So we'll just go ahead and hit okay. Photoshop will work its magic and fill in that information. This part doesn't need to be perfect because we won't see most of this anyways. Uh, there's this weird little line in the middle because we had that two pixel feather. So I'm going to hit S on my keyboard for the clone stamp tool. And I'm just going to paint these pixels in. If you want to avoid this step, you can just do a uh, pixel feather of zero when you make your selection. So this first foreground layer is pretty much done. So we're going to export this right now. Make sure that your format is set to PNG, transparency is enabled, and uh, when you go to export it, place it wherever you'd like to stay organized. Next, we're gonna grab our quick selection tool and select the sky. If it makes too much of a selection or it selects part of an image you don't like, you can just hold option on your keyboard and deselect the parts of the image you don't want selected. And then once we've made the selection, we'll delete it and export this mountain layer without the sky. On to image two, drag and drop. And this one we are going to, before we actually jump into it, I don't like the road, so I want to remove this road. I'm gonna use the clone stamp tool again by hitting S on my keyboard. And I'm just gonna paint this road away. This is totally optional. If you don't mind the road being in it, that's totally fine. So we're just gonna speed up and paint through this real quick. Now for this image, we're gonna use the quick selection tool again to select our foreground. And we'll use delete to remove that part of our selection. So the foreground's gone. Now it's time to switch and uh, right click, select inverse, and now remove the sky. So we have these layers separated. I wanna use this sky background as our like absolute and total background layer for the animation. So we're going to use the lasso tool to make a crude selection so we can use content aware to get a nice clean background. You can feel, feel free to use any method you'd like to cut this out. Edit, content aware fill. Uh, selection looks pretty good and yep, I'm happy with that. So we'll hit okay. And now we have a clean sky background. So I'm gonna label that sky and label this other layer as well. 
and these are pretty much good to export. Now for our last image. With this image, we're going to cut it up into two different layers. We're going to have the Kent flipping layer and the boat foreground layer. So command J again to duplicate layers. I'm going to go ahead and name these. I'm going to start with the pen tool and uh, we'll begin to cut Kent out with the pen tool. Because there's a little bit of motion blur, I'm definitely going to maintain this two pixel feather for our radius. And we'll cut everything out but Kent. Now we will hide the Kent layer and uh, use the pen tool and cut out the boat. All right, now that the boat's cut out, we'll get, we're going to remove the sky and Kent. So we have these two layers. Now, because Kent's going to be moving in this final animation, there's a little bit of a problem with that reflection there since we're not going to have that reflection move. So I'm going to use the clone stamp tool, S, on the keyboard. I'm going to sample uh, more of the water and remove him from the image. I'm happy. So let's go ahead and export these layers. Now, lastly, this little bonus one, I want this goat to be in our the, the beginning of our animation. So I'm gonna use the pen tool and cut them out. In the download, you'll see I just included the goat already cut out, so I'll just save you this step. We're now done with Photoshop, so now it's time to open up After Effects. From your project bin, you'll hit Command-I to import, and you can navigate through your computer to find your layers you saved from Photoshop. We'll hit this button to make a new composition. Make sure that your composition's width is set to 1080, and the height is set to 1350. I'm gonna go with 24 frames a second and the duration will be 30 seconds just to be safe. Now we'll drag our layers into our composition. Make sure that the image you want to be in the back will be at the bottom, and the image you want to be closer to you will be at the top. Now that we have all of our layers here, I'm going to hit return or enter on my keyboard to relabel these. Organization is very important in After Effects because we'll have a lot of different layers in here. Now I'm gonna hide pretty much all the layers except for our background plate. I'm going to select all of them and hit this cube icon. That will make them all 3D. This motion blur icon right here will enable later, but just to make it easier on our computer, we won't have it selected now because it's a bit more render intensive. Now, once I've selected the sky layer, you can hit P on your keyboard for position, and you'll see now we have a third controller you can slide. So the first two are your X and Y axis. This last one is your Z axis, Z space. This controls how close or far away it is in 3D space. So I'm going to move this back a ways. You can slide like this or manually type in. I'm going to go with 5,000 just to get it away. Then I'll hit S on the keyboard to bring up scale and scale it up. Now I'll unhide the mountain layer and do the exact same thing. I'm thinking like, four, let's go with 4,700. And I'll hit S on the keyboard to scale it up. P on the keyboard to reposition it. I'll unhide our hill layer. Before we get any further, we'll go up to layer, new, and hit camera. I'm gonna label the, we're gonna make this a 50 millimeter camera, labeling it 50 millimeters. We're gonna make sure that this is at the very top of our layer stack. This is the master layer that'll control the way we view all the other layers. Now, if you come over here to the one view tab, I'm gonna scroll down to two views and make sure that it's set to uh, top. So this is our bird's eye view of the camera. This triangle right here represents our digital camera. I'm gonna twirl down the transform options, move ahead in time a little bit and set a point of interest and position keyframe. We can move back to our hill layer and I'm gonna move this back in Z space until we can see it. Selecting our camera, if you move your mouse cursor over, you can when you see the Z pop up, you can grab it and drag it along the Z axis. I'm going to switch our view to back. Now I can grab the Y and lift the camera up in the Y axis as well. And that lifts our camera up, makes it taller. So we're going to start with a very basic camera animation right now. Also, I recommend dropping your playback to a third or a quarter, depending on how powerful your computer is, just so it doesn't have to play back in full quality. So I've dropped some keyframes just to give us kind of a crude animation feel right now. I like to animate as I go because I can place layers where they make the most sense based on how the animation is coming together. So I'm gonna make a few adjustments here. And I recommend playing around with the position and point of interest just to see how you can manipulate the camera in 3D space. And I would also recommend kind of jumping back and forth between our back view of the camera and the top bird's eye view of the camera. Now it's time to unhide our Kirkjafell mountain layer. I'm gonna hit P on the keyboard to bring up position, and I'm going to start placing these layers in 3D space. 
if you don't want to play around with positioning and finding what looks best for your animation, you can just copy all the numbers you see on my screen. So right now we're just finding the best position for Kirk Jafel. So when the camera dollies back, we'll just, just miss the side of the mountain to really lean into that parallax effect. Now, as the camera dollies back at this point, you'll see that the hill layer is not big enough. So we will select the hill layer and hit S on your keyboard for scale and we'll scale it up to fill the scene. Now we will unhide the boat layer and start positioning the boat layer in space as well. Then we'll unhide Kent and position him in 3D space as well. Just kind of scrubbing through the timeline a little bit to see where everything lies, make sure that it all feels good. I do a blend of actually entering values or using the value slider to place the camera. Uh, sometimes it's kind of nice to just click the camera itself and move it back with your mouse cursor. This is about as far away as I think I want our camera to be. So as you'll see, we'll have to scale up those two layers in the back. So we'll scale up our hill layer. Another way you can get around that problem instead of scaling would be to change the angle of the camera. So on the position slider, I'm just gonna pan the camera a little bit to the right. So as it gets back to that point, it'll pan right instead of seeing the edges of those layers. And keyframes are your friend. When the camera gets to its furthest away point, I'd like to have it zoom back in or dolly back in to Kent just to see the, like just to focus on the flipping motion. So I'm setting keyframes every time I move the camera. I'm making little keyframes and adjustments so we're not seeing the edges of our layers. And again, if you'd like to feel free at any point to pause the video and just copy the values I've entered. Now, when I was screen recording this, I totally forgot to record the part where we animate his flip. So I went back to reanimate that layer for you. So what I've done now is turned off all of the layers except for Kent's layer and the sky layer, just so the computer can render through a little bit faster. And so we don't have all the distraction of everything that's going on in the background layer. So as the camera zooms back, we'll see there's Kent fixed in 3D space. Um, but what we need to do first is change our anchor point. So when we rotate him, he rotates at his hips and not where the rest of the image is. So we'll hit A on the keyboard to bring up anchor point and you can just slide it over until he's right in the middle of all those arrows. Then we'll hit P on our keyboard to bring up position. And I wanna have him fall just a little bit, like just falling down in Y space a little bit. So we'll start at the beginning of the animation and drop a keyframe and go to the end of Kent's animation and just drop him down, let's say, 400, 450, just so he falls a little bit. It should be super subtle. Awesome, that looks good. Now it's time for rotation. So we'll hit R on the keyboard to bring up rotation. We're gonna change our Z rotation. So we'll go to the frame where we first see Kent come into the animation and I'm gonna change our value to 100. We'll let it play through until we get to the end of where we see Kent in this animation and I'll enter a value of negative 10. So when we play back, we'll see he's now spinning on his hips as an axis and really slowly completing that backflip. Next, it's time to use our puppet tool to move his limbs around gently. So we'll hit this puppet tool icon here at the top. I'm gonna zoom in and change our quality to full just so we can really see what we're doing. And I'm gonna start dropping puppet pins at most of his major joints and in the middle of his shins. The puppet tool is really fun. You can play around with it as much as you'd like. So again, if you don't want to play around with it, just copy where I put mine. I'm gonna zoom out and go to the beginning of where we see Kent's full body. And we're gonna make the adjustments. I want his legs to be bent inward a little bit more. So I'm gonna grab each pin and just slowly bring them in. You can scale back down to a third resolution if it's taking a while for your computer to render. Now you'll see we don't wanna have his shins just broken and spaghetti noodled. So be wary of what the puppet tool is doing as far as distortion goes to your image. What's nice is wherever your time indicator is on the timeline, when you make these adjustments, it'll drop keyframes right there for you. And I will go further ahead in time. And uh, down here in our 
effects tab, we're gonna make sure puppet tool is twirled down and mesh one is twirled down. And then we'll twirl down deform also. Now you'll see on the timeline little dots indicating where keyframes are. So for those puppet pins that we've made adjustments to, we're going to twirl those down as well, just to see those keyframes so we can grab them if we need. Delete our beginning reference keyframes. Now I'm going to select all of those keyframes we actually made adjustments to and move them to the beginning of um, our Kent animation. Then we'll move our now we'll move our time indicator further ahead in time, and we'll move those puppet pins to manipulate his legs to end up where we'd like them. So this feels okay. So the next thing we're gonna do is select all of those keyframes we just made and move them ahead in the timeline until Kent just disappears. So now when we play back, we'll actually see his legs move because of the puppet tool. Now this is the optional step. We're gonna place the goat in 3D space as well. I'm gonna rename the layer goat. We're gonna hit P on the keyboard on our hill layer just to bring up its position so we can have our goat layer match that position. Then I will use both P for position, R for rotation to manipulate that layer and place it where we'd like it to be. Now we will basically rinse and repeat the same puppet tool techniques we did with the Kent layer because I wanna have the goat have a subtle bit of movement. I want the goat's head to go from looking at the ground to looking a little further ahead. So we'll just rinse and repeat these steps. Again, totally optional. Feel free to play around with this. There, that looks good to me. Now I didn't include this in the download, but you can go find a fog or cloud PNG that's free for use just in so many places on the internet. So if you want to have some clouds or fog in your image, I just go search. I know Premium Beat usually has some pretty cool cloud or fog assets. So I have this 3D fog PNG. It's uh, not 3D, but I'm gonna go ahead and drop it in the composition, make it 3D and rename it. I'm gonna hit P on the keyboard on our mountain layer and P on the keyboard on our hill layer, just so I have the position data for both of those layers. And then I'll hit P on the keyboard for the fog layer and place it somewhere in between that feels good. From there, I'm using S for scale to scale it up, P for position to move it where I'd like it, and then Command D on our fog layer to duplicate that layer, switching back to P for position. And then I'll hit R on the keyboard to bring up rotation and give it a 180 degree rotation just so it's not the, uh, the exact same cloud image. Then hit T on your keyboard for opacity. I'm gonna drop this down to like 50, 75, 75 looks good. Got, so I had to cut a few things out of this tutorial like setting a focus distance and all of those things. They're not totally necessary, but if you want it to be a bit more immersive or a bit more like I guess direct people's eyes to particular layers, I would, you know, also mess around with setting keyframes for your focus distance. The fun part is in using the camera layer and changing perspective in an interesting way that's that can't be done in real life. Now, before you take off, hit me up on socials and show me if you ended up doing an animation with these layers or if you started animating any other photos uh, based on this tutorial. I'd love to see what you guys put together. If you found this helpful, uh, give a like and subscribe. It helps the channel grow. And, and feel free to let me know in the comments what else you'd like to see from me. But that's pretty much it. Thanks for watching. Peace.